welcome to season three of the Spotlight series, Don't Just Survive, Thrive. Season one was launched to help people through the pandemic by talking to a variety of experts about topics such as psychology, finance and health. Season two focused on more work-related issues, including HR, marketing and leadership. Now it is time for season three. Season three is centred on the IT industry, specifically tech startups. There are also career spotlights where I talk to senior IT people about the secrets to their impressive career journeys. My name is Nicholas Steele, founder of JJP Talent Solutions, an Australian IT recruitment company. For over 20 years, I've helped tech startups and innovative SMEs to attract, recruit and retain technical talent. I hope you enjoy listening. I'm delighted to introduce Dave West. Until recently, Dave was senior data scientist at Origin Energy. In November, he founded a tech startup called BatNav. Today, we'll talk about Dave's passion for the future of energy, merging digital and AI technologies with engineering and business, and how this can benefit both people and the planet. Dave, thank you for joining me on season three, episode seven, of the Spotlight series, Don't Just Survive, Thrive. Thanks, Nicola. It's great to be here. Thank you for the thank lovely intro. Thank you very much. Um, so I can see there, looking at your bookcase, wow, you have got such varied interests and also such a varied background. So tell me about your career journey. Yeah, I Definitely have a zigzag career journey, but underpinned really from it's the passion for and a love for um, science and maths and engineering. And um, I guess uh, I grew up in country New South Wales, came to university in Queensland. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to do business or engineering and sort of one of those pivotal decisions where I sort of took the engineering path and have done that for the last 20 odd years and have loved it because I just I just get so into the science and and love learning um, sort of really quite tough subjects and that's taken me on to do a PhD and then into machine learning and AI um, and I probably throughout that whole couple of decades that I've been working as an engineer and studying as an engineer I guess I've always just had this restlessness and and feeling like I just want to do something more entrepreneurial um, engineers tend to be fairly stereotypical and I don't think I've ever really fit exactly into what an engineering stereotype is so um, yeah it's it's the engineering was something that it was almost like a, it, was, it was a love just through the fascination with science and, and using that to solve problems. And, and but I'll always, while I've been doing that, it's just sort of this underlying sort of desire to, to break free and do something a little bit more adventurous. That's well, that really neatly leads me on to the next question, actually, because you were at Origin uh, and finished very recently for over 11 years. Um, <clears throat> mm which is a fairly long time. So what made you decide, I'm going to leave that successful 11 years there and set up your own startup? Um, I think, you know, I'm 40 now. Um, Origin has was a great experience for me from the time when I finished my PhD. We started in the gas boom, so we started with APLNG. So I was in APLNG, um, which is Origin's joint venture, uh, coal seam gas to LNG project with ConocoPhillips and Sinopec. Um, I was in there from a very early stage and got some fantastic experience, worked with some amazing people. Um, it's a really good company in many respects, Origin, and I thoroughly got really good experience throughout those 11 years. But I think you, you sort of get to sort of that mid-career point and you sort of hit um, a bit of a career cul-de-sac, if, if, you, if you will. You sort of get to a point where as well, I've gone this far, I can turn around and go back in a different direction or I can just sort of um, draw a line under it and then move on to something, something else. And I've been observing energy storage and renewables for a number of years, probably a decade at least. Mm -hmm. And um, 
a few things came together, a few uh, relationships sort of just joined up and connected a few dots. And um, like I said, over those last two decades, just sort of had that underlying restlessness or desire to, to really do something risky <laughs> and, and um, um, un, untested before. And I guess, you know, when the, the stars align and I had the support from my wife and the support from my family and friends, so it just made sense. Perfect. Um, and that word cul-de-sac, you don't hear very often in Australia. That's quite a British word, which <laughs> yeah, <it is. laughs> might come from your wife's side of the family there. It probably does, yeah. Um, and with regards to BatNav, tell me a bit more about BatNav and, and what the startup is aiming to achieve, the mission, the vision, the purpose and, and everything. Yeah, so... Um, I'm combining a couple of different areas that I'm passionate about. So one's materials engineering and manufacturing. The other is machine learning and AI and then delivering SaaS products. So you put all those things together and, you know, also renewable energy, energy storage and those sorts of things as well. So what BatNab does is it exists to make energy storage more affordable so that the energy transition can continue. So like renewables were, so solar and wind were a decade ago, um, energy storage technologies are expensive and relatively unproven. Um, energy generators, so renewable energy generators want to invest in energy storage, but there's lots of different technologies. And the knowledge, the expertise among engineers is relatively scarce. Mm -hmm. So lithium-ion batteries or hydrogen energy storage or flow batteries, these are not things that are typically taught in the university setting and typically not taught across um, utility operators, the sort of specialised knowledge within manufacturers. So I could see that there was going to be this growing demand in the, the need for that sort of expertise and knowledge. Um, and that's going to be good for business. If you have high demand and low supply, you can get Good, good prices there. So there's a commercial opportunity there. And then I put together the machine learning AI, building software, and I thought, well, what if I could take that experience from APLNG buying high-spec materials and build it into a way where I could automate the delivery of that expertise and knowledge so that um, buyers of big batteries or big energy storage systems can get those services in a SaaS rather than going to uh, an engineering um, consultant and having a human write out a document, which is very time consuming and all the time you have to waste on formatting the document and those sorts of things and build that together so that I can take something that's scarce, which is knowledge and scale it yes. across the world with, without any constraints in time or geography. Um, and that's sort of the first product that we use. Our first product is called Cell Engineer. It is effectively a specification for manufacturing and quality assurance of lithium ion cells. So it can be used by uh, a utility company, which is buying a big battery for storing excess renewable or wind power. It could be a mine in Western Australia, which is off grid and they're setting up renewable energy and they want to be able to run 24 seven operations and they're buying a, a 50 megawatt hour battery. So a $40 million battery they're exposed to quite a lot of risk in making those big decisions. Mm -hmm. These are sort of 50, 100, 200 million dollar decisions and no single person in the organisation has the delegation of authority to make that decision. So we help those companies, those individuals, those committees um, de-risk or understand the risk better and manage it. And that's really how we do it. That's fantastic. So not simplifying as such, but uh, making it more accessible for something that is really complex um, definitely, definitely. Um, it's in some. It's our products are not for everybody. Not everybody wants to go to the level that we're doing. So what we, what we, how we look at it is we educate, we enable, and then we empower. And and then once you educate and enable, then then the uh, the customer, our Batnav customers, can make the decision how they use the knowledge. But at least they have it there if they need it. Perfect. And the name Batnav, what's that short yeah. for? I don't know. I, that <laughs> just came to me. Um, it's sort of, it was catchy because a sat nav sort of takes you from A to B. So if you're in a foreign country and you've got a sat nav and say you're driving across France or something, you'll, you rely on a sat nav to get you from one side of France to the other. And so with the world of big batteries and energy storage, we're helping people navigate the technologies yeah. so that they get to the right place. Perfect. Um, and you've been in energy for, for many years now. So what keeps you 
intrigued and passionate about energy and the energy industry. <laughs> it doesn't take a lot to keep me intrigued about anything really. Being a materials engineer, you can basically, I can basically look at a block of steel and get fascinated by that because my imagination takes me inside it to all the atoms and and um, interactions between them. So energy has been um, a really interesting industry over the last couple of decades because there's so mm. much change. Um, you know, for the last 50 years, probably spinning base load coal fired power stations was the majority of energy generation. But in the last two decades, we've seen gas coming online. We've seen LNG imports, solar and wind. Um, climate change and the need to address climate change has grown in terms of public concern. And so there has just been this underlying social and political drivers that are moving the industry to change mm -hmm. um, when that's happening and and uh, the systems are so large and and we all rely on energy so much it's such a important part of that drives the way that we live mm -hmm. and the things that we can do and um, what we can protect in terms of our our countries and our our lifestyles it's um just interwoven is everything so it's it's been a really fascinating uh, journey and and the scale of it is so large the scale is huge like if you actually look at the numbers of energy generation globally they get to such a level that you can't fathom how big it is and the amount of um, activity that that generates is is uh, mind-blowing yes absolutely I mean I, I remember at school in the 80s and, and 90s we were talking about the future of energy and renewables so it's been that conversation has been going on for a, a long time and I think we are starting to use more renewable energy but it's as you say how do you store it as well and the, yeah. and the growth there what have been the main challenges so far would you say timing uh having enough capital mm -hmm. with having the right team and then um having the right product and market fit um, I think the, the product market fit was there. Um, I could see that it was going to work. I had uh, a team of people that are interested in, and they could see they could see the vision, they could see that they wanted to do it, um, and they were ready to come on board. But then the problem was I didn't have any capital. Yeah. So then I had to go and ask friends and family to chip in some money, and, again, they could see – they could see the vision, they could see where it was going, they could see the need, they wanted to be involved. So it's lining up all of those things. So it's it's um, uh, the challenges are constantly evolving. You think you've solved one thing and then the next thing pops up and it's, it's like a never-ending process of learning, which is great because I, I love that need to be creative, that need to be challenged, um, the need to learn things that I've never learned before. Mm -hmm. And um, doing this is is unlike any job that I've had before. It's, it certainly has its downsides in terms of um, uncertainty and lack of <laughs> lack of knowing where your income is going to come from for a short period of time. Um, but the upsides are, are really high, particularly for someone like me. Yes. And you kind of thrive on those challenges. <laughs> and um... Yeah, I do. I do. And that uncertainty, I guess. Uh, can be exciting it can make you anxious but um it's it's going with all those constant changes and challenges yeah i think it's just something you have to, you have to learn to live with a lot of a lot of other professionals and careers live with a constant uncertainty and i probably have been fortunate not to have to live with that for a long time so it's just an adjustment in the way that i think yeah absolutely and you mentioned as well one of the challenges was um was building your your team there so in terms of your core values and how they drive the culture of your team tell me a little bit more about that yeah it's it's um I've done a lot of work managing engineering teams and technical teams and also software teams um, and building frameworks agile frameworks to take ideas from like in the in the case with origin taking ideas from operators in the business and then converting that into software products so i knew which tools to pick very quickly as to bring that in but i also made sure that everyone was involved uh, and and it was a collaborative decision making process 
So it's not so much culture, but this is more about the systems and the tools that we use. So we just very quickly on what um, uh, email platforms we were going to use, what communication platforms we were going to use, and we, we made that decision collaboratively and tried to minimise the number of things. Um, from a culture point of view, probably just take the vanilla agile approaches of having small teams and mm-hmm. and letting them be autonomous to make their decisions and execute their work. Um, we're really not big enough to be able to explain it more than that at this stage. But um, I think from what you've said, um, the two key things that are really driving the culture, so to speak, and that's kind of a fairly ambiguous word in a, to a certain extent anyway, is uh, the collaboration and the autonomy is something that you seem to have built yeah. into your team there from what you say. So I do have a little, I can, I can talk a little bit more about it, but it's um, really, we, we follow some principles, which is stretching the technology. And so that comes from where like machine learning, AI and automation is like as a huge opportunity for uh, humanity and the world to be able to do far more with less. But we'll only do that by making the most of the technology. If we, if we treat it as a bit of a gimmick and don't really test its abilities, then we will lose an opportunity to do some amazing things for people on the planet. That's brilliant. So it's a, you're not using AI, machine learning, et cetera, for the buzzword, hey, we're doing this. It's actually making it really um, do its hard work and what have you. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I'm having that, that um, conversation at the moment with my funding advisor going to potential investors. Is, is investors want to hear AI. They want to see that you're using AI. I don't, having worked in that area, mm-hmm. um, I don't see the need to say that AI is there. It exists. We'll use it in the right in the right manner at the right time to solve the right problem. We're not going to use it for AI's sake. So, um, but when we do use it, we will use it to its full capacity. Absolutely. Yeah. And I totally get that. You you know I'm a Yorkshire lass like your your wife there, and we like to get <laughs> get our money's worth out of things. So Absolutely, make yeah. sh- make sure you're using it to its its full potential and capacity yep. there. Absolutely. Um, so, Batnav, very new at the moment. What are your long-term plans? Where are you going to be next year, five years, 2030? What What can you see happening? Yeah, so um, we will release our first product next week, which is called Cell Engineer. Um, we're already starting on the second one, which could be similar to Cell Engineer, um, but more related to the battery management system. But some of the initial feedback we've had from customers is to go uh, take a little, a little bit step back and just sort of do a functional specification, not for sort of like the really big batteries, but for more for the uh, smaller facility size batteries. So if you can imagine you have a, a battery backup system for a hospital or a university or a manufacturing plant, um, these sort of systems are going to be sort of like two megawatt hours, maybe $2 million. Um, the the buyer of those batteries is not going to do the deep dive, but they need to, need to know enough about what they need to check when they buy it. So that could be our second product as well. Then we're going to work on, I don't really actually want to tell you what the third product is because it's actually pretty exciting and it's very, very different to what we're doing already. Um, but before we get to that point, it'll be more of these automated specifications, automated documents that basically take um, expert knowledge. So I work with a couple of um, PhD qualified battery experts from the US. They've got 30 plus years experience working for um, well-known lithium ion battery manufacturers in North America. Um, They've helped me build Cell Engineer. We will do similar things like that. We will partner up with experts like that, build their knowledge into a product, and then deploy it on our platform. So the BatNav will effectively become a platform for distributing expertise. Fantastic. So yeah. that's the growth plans um, in the immediate future. and That's right, and yeah. So, so we will do products like that over the next 6 to 12 months. The, the I guess, the, the stealth project, which I don't want to tell you about, we will start okay. doing, doing in about 6 to 9 months' time. Uh-huh. Um, that's pending the, the funding that we're going for at the moment, um, but we'll still do, still do that anyway. Um, 
Yeah, so so it'll be roughly a 12 to 18 months before we start thinking about what the next decision is for Batanav, whether it's a trade sale or whether it's some other liquidity event. Um, the investors that we want to get over the next in the next uh, two to three months will influence a lot about those sorts of decisions and milestones that we have. That's great. Excellent. Um, so coming back to your uh, career in data science, AI, machine learning, etc. What skills would you say is, is, are essential for someone who's interested in a career in data science, AI, ML? It's a very varied area and very ill-defined area, which means that data science can be as simple as um, joining a couple of data frames and doing a, uh, a colourful plot. And then you take that from it to the extreme spectrum of AI where you have a PhD qualified mathematician fine-tuning a uh, recurrent neural network to predict time series forecasting. I don't think there's a simple answer to that. What I do believe, though, is that the skills in data science and machine learning and AI are just tools that all professionals will know in the future. Mm-hmm. So, and the reason I say that is um, in first year university for any science student, engineering student, and I don't know about commerce or economics, economics would for sure, um, you would learn about linear regression, which is taking um, bivariate data. So data on the x-axis, data on the y-axis, you plot the data points and you draw a straight line through it. Mm-hmm. Linear regression is just the maths to, that justifies that. Most machine learning regression algorithms effectively follow that. They just have different ways of uh, determining the the fit of that particular line. And it's not not always a a straight line. It can be a curved line. It can be, you know, it's just various degrees of subtleties, but really just following the same idea. And the reason that we do a linear regression to fit that line between the X's and the Y's is so that we can know something to solve a problem. We want to know, we want to know if we change X, how much will that change Y? And we don't know that because we're data scientists or we like doing machine learning. We know we're doing that because we want to solve a problem. We want to build a building. We want to cure cancer. We want to save the environment. They're skills that are just used for problem solving. They're not skills that, and as a profession as such, and that can be a bit of a downfall in the hyped up corporate world is that people will think they need data scientists and machine learning engineers and this and that. But what they've actually got in their own business is people with the ability to do that work that understand the context and the subject matter. And what they should be doing is training those people, giving them the tools to continue being engineers, to continue being accountants, to continue being whatever they do within the business but giving them the skills to be able to, to do their job better. That's, I thought you were going to say problem solving. Um, mm. It's going to be really key. And I, what I really like about that, I was uh, listening to the ACS Digital Pulse 2020 report earlier this year. Um, and by great news, by 2025, we'll need a, over 150,000 additional uh, people in the, the tech workforce but how are we going to meet that demand? And if you look internally, don't look for loads of data science or AI or machine learning people, train the people up in the organization that exemplify those really outstanding problem solving skills. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, They're already there. And um, uh, my experience with big organizations is, is that there tends to be a, a cult, uh, not a cult, an organizational inertia, inertia or an organizational rigidity where those types of people, they're tied up in just sort of the day-to-day business and they're not free or they don't have the time and space to acquire those new skills. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, a big, it's a big challenge for the, those big organizations to be able to work out how to do that. Um, so th- they, they can work in, in a... Uh, have a centralized digital sort of focus, but that tends to create a bit of um, separation between the people that are actually know about the the subject matter and the context that they're working in. Um, 
or if you distribute it and train everyone up doing it, then you're going to have a, a fairly long period of inefficiency and probably a few um, a few bad outcomes while you're waiting for everybody to, to really get competent. Mm-hmm. This is a big challenge. Definitely, definitely. Um, and coming back to the energy sector, which you've been in, as you say, uh, for several years, well, many years, very passionate about it. What are your future predictions for the energy sector? It'll continue to be diverse. Um, uh, generation and storage technologies, um, whether they're fossil fuel or renewable, will just continue to become more and more diverse. Um, so you've got biomass renewables, you've got solar, you've got wind. Um, we will still have a, some places where fossil fuels are just the right solution for that particular location. And the economics will drive some of that Um Security and reliability will drive some of it too. So to have a complete system where you have no fossil fuels I think is unlikely. You're still going to have a certain amount of fossil fuels. But we'll continue to see diverse uh, combinations of different systems. So energy storage systems um, can often be coupled, like different energy storage systems can be coupled to form hybrid energy storage systems. So uh, a lithium-ion battery is very good for rapid delivery or rapid receipt of electricity from uh, a grid connection. Um, but the volume of energy that it can store is relatively low. So it can handle those rapid changes. But if you coupled that with a hybrid system of a flow battery or some other uh, better long-term storage system like a, a closed uh, so a closed circuit um, hydrogen system, which doesn't exist yet, but it could do, or a compressed air system, um, then you start to think. Then you start to get to a situation where you can meet the needs of that particular application in that particular location. But in terms of like predictions and energy energy storage itself, so you've got the closed circuit hydrogen, which is exciting but economically really really challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of technical issues to deal with there um, the other thing about hydrogen is it's not as efficient as you think the round, round trip efficiency is quite low compared to a lithium-ion battery so lithium-ion battery is sort of in the order of 90 percent efficiency um, i think the closed circuit hydrogen is roughly about 60 percent pumped hydro is about 75 percent so every time that you charge and discharge your storage facility you're actually losing a quarter or a third of your energy. So those, those are important considerations as well. There's compressed air energy storage systems, there's liquefied energy storage systems, liquefied air energy storage systems. As I said, there's flow batteries, there's supercapacitors, there's superconductors, all of which have their advantages in different, different situations. Um, and all are really new technologies. Most people know nothing about them. That's what that is going to solve. So having that diversity um, and looking at all these newer, newer technologies, renewables, but not having reliance on coal, gas, et cetera, but there's still going to be a need for those kind of energy resources, you'd say. I think so. Um, I can't really see a situation. You're, you're from the Northern Hemisphere, for example, right? Yorkshire, it's freezing cold. Right? And relative to most of the Northern Hemisphere, York, Yorkshire is not that cold. Um, could you imagine life without heat in Yorkshire? Oh, it'd be horrible. Exactly. <laughs> people, have, people have got to live. People, have, people will need energy. Now, we'll electrify as much of it as we can, but there will be certain circumstances where you will need fossil fuels to yeah. deliver energy to people. Um, it's hard to imagine a world where you wouldn't have a percentage of fossil fuels being used. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And uh, yes, coming from Yorkshire, that's why I moved from to Australia, because <laughs> I didn't like the cold, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and just coming a little bit off the energy topic, but I noticed, um, and when I've been talking to you, you're an active volunteer supporting uh, indigenous people, education, alleviating poverty. So why do you think, Dave, that volunteering is so important? I really enjoy meeting people from different backgrounds. That's probably one thing where volunteering just puts you in a, a different environment that I, I really enjoy. Um, 
and I, I think I just like that challenge of, of going into different arenas and, and meeting different people and, and trying to contribute to a cause as well. Um, like, for example, with Career Trackers was just such a great learning experience. Um, and it was, it was not so much that, you know, working with young Indigenous people and being impressed by them because uh, that, uh, that didn't surprise me at all. But putting myself in that arena, it really stretched me into doing, I had to facilitate workshops and I got to learn how to use simulations to, as, a, as a tool for learning. Right? And it's a, a simula- it was a simulated game that I was facilitating for these young, um, the young students. And um, it always just pushes me into something that I learn and grow from, I think, more than anything. Origin is a really great company in terms of volunteering. They don't, they don't promote it actively, I think, in their community, but it was about a decade ago that they started the Origin Foundation and the people that work at Origin really get behind it and really are passionate about it and uh, Origin supports their people to do that. So I think my ability to do the volunteering that I have done is because working for a big organisation like that. That's really fantastic. And um, you get out as much as you put in, so to speak. For sure, um, yeah. Which is, is great. That's fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing your insights, Dave. Is there anything else that you'd like to share at all? No, just a big thank you to you. I just enjoyed having that conversation. It's nice to be able to um, be asked those questions and be forced to think about them because you know sometimes you go through life and you, you don't stop and pause and reflect. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe, rate and review. If you're looking for career advice, your next career opportunity, or to grow your tech team, then please call me, Nicholas Steele, on 0499 773 546, or go to our website, jjptalent.com.au. The Don't Just Survive Thrive podcast is part of the Spotlight series, which includes the YouTube channel, Spotlight on Software Development. If you want more insights into the software industry, particularly tech startups, then subscribe to the Spotlight on Software Development YouTube channel. Thank you for listening. Until next time.